meetings uh, portion of the conference was uh, really terrific. Um, beginning with the governor's uh, speech, um, highlighting where we are, uh, where he had been personally, and how he had come to uh, the issue of North Korea human rights. And followed by uh, a panel discussion on the current state of, of human rights uh, in North Korea. Now we're uh, very pleased to uh, begin the second session, uh, developing a human rights strategy. And um, I want to introduce very briefly our speakers uh, sitting on my right. If you see inside your uh, folder, there is a more extensive uh, uh, bios of the speakers. So I will just simply highlight uh, the, their current uh, positions. On my right is Ms. Gisela Gori, um, currently senior political advisor in the political security and development section of the delegation of the European Union to the United States. Um, she has uh, taught at George Washington University Law School, and she is currently on sabbatical from a position where she serves as, the law as a lawyer for the Council of Europe's Directorate General of Human Rights and Legal Affairs in Strasbourg, France. She holds a PhD in law from the European University Institute in Florence. I'm going to introduce all of the speakers now so we can get the, uh, the discussions going. Uh, to Gisela's right is Greg, help me with your last Scarlet. name, Scarlett Duke, um, is Executive Director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea uh, here in Washington, D.C. And uh, I know him for many years where he was the Director of Public Affairs and Business Issues at the Korea Economic Institute. And we're very happy to have him here. Uh, on his right is Ben, ben Rogers who is the uh, East Asia team leader at the International Human Rights Organization, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, where he specializes in North Korea, Burma, and Indonesia, and oversees CSW's work in the rest of the region. And CSW um, is an organization I'm personally very familiar with in my uh, previous uh, incarnation, where I was the director of the Freedom House's North Korea Human Rights Project, and we had worked very closely with um, Ben's predecessor, Elizabeth Botha at CSW. Uh, to his right is Kang Chur Hwan, who I met, I think, about 10 days after he had a private meeting with then President George Bush. Um, Kang Chur Hwan is a, currently a researcher and staff writer at the Chosun Irbo's Northeast Asia Research Center, as well as the vice chairman of, the, of CDNK and director of the North Korea Strategy Center. Uh, we all know him uh, from his writings, but from his uh, book that I think serves as uh, a textbook for just about every Korea studies course on North Korea, the Aquariums of Pyongyang. I just came back um, uh, from a, a, a lecture that I give uh, a couple of times a year at Fort Leavenworth uh, at an at a American military base where where American army, off, I mean officers in general, go uh, to study uh, these uh, uh, country cases, and, and they read this book as part of their uh, syllabus. So we're very pleased to have, I think, a first-rate uh, uh, discussants panelist, and I want to go ahead and begin uh, with uh, Ms. Gori. Thank you very much. Does it? Oh. it it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your kind words of introduction and uh, to have invited me here today. I uh, work as, uh, for the European Union delegation and as you know the European Union is very much involved in human rights um, all around the world, both in this neighborhood but also all around the world. And uh, I would like to uh, underline that this engagement and the involvement of the European on human rights before getting uh, to our specific topic, I would like to make a few preliminary remarks. Uh, this engagement I was saying is following two dimensions, a bilateral and a multilateral dimensions. Uh, following our uh, reorganization in the treaty, in the legal basis of the European Union, following what's called the Lisbon Treaty, human rights uh, have become, are, are currently at the core of the external action of the European Union. Human rights, in fact, are embedded in the overall political and development cooperation that the European Union has with third countries. But as I said, 
there is also a multilateral dimension. The European Union is very much engaged in promoting human rights and complete its bilateral, bilateral efforts uh, with an engagement at, uh, in multilateral fora. And I'm referring here to the UN and in particular to the Human Rights Council and to the um, UN General Assembly. And uh, in this multilateral dimension, the European Union uh, encouraged all member states to ratify in, uh, regional and international instruments and to ensure to guarantee full compliance with this instrument. Uh, the human rights policy of the, U of the European Union uh, is, re is clearly linked to the goal of stability, prosperity, and security. Um, as democracy and the respect of human rights bring along with them stability and um, peace and prosperity. I must say that with regard to the Korean Peninsula, um, the EU uh, as a global economic and political actor has a legitimate uh, interest in bringing, I mean in promoting, in encouraging peace and stability. However, it has not the same kind of interest, of security interest, that more neighboring countries. But nonetheless, the European Union aims at uh, support, uh, giving a contribution, uh, though not to play a main role in, um, in the peninsula. With more respect to the situation in the Demo Democratic People's uh, Republic of Korea, uh, the European Union is uh, very much concerned, is very seriously, seriously concerned with the human rights situation. In particular, concerns are relative to the widespread use of torture and uh, of labor camps against political pris uh, prisoners and citizens uh, who have attempted uh, to flee the country. Uh, we are also concerned about the extensive use of death penalty um, and uh, to the pervasive, and we are concerned by the pervasive restriction with respect to the freedoms. I'm talking about freedom of thought, assembly, religion, and expression. Finally, we are also concerned about the almost complete exclusions of citizens from the participation in the conduct of public affairs. Uh, but the European Union is not only concerned with the civil and political rights, it's also concerned with the economic, social, and cultural rights. In particular, uh, as they reflect uh, in a serious uh, situation of uh, malnutrition and widespread health problems for all the population, but even more uh, grave uh, with regards to uh, particularly vulnerable categories like children um, or the elderly people. What do we do <laughs> to assess, to address these concerns? As I said before, there are twofold dimensions. The multilateral first. The EU um, regularly runs uh, a resolution uh, in the UN uh, General Assembly. And this year, in the 66th General Assembly, which is currently taking place in New York, the EU is once again running a resolution on the human rights situation in the Demo Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Uh, I would like to underline that this country-specific uh, resolution, uh, that the EU runs <coughs> this country-specific resolution only with respect to other two countries, which are Iran and Burma, Myanmar. Um, the resolution strongly urges the government to put um, an end to the systematic, widespread, and uh, serious human rights violation in the country. And it also encourages the government to cooperate fully with the human rights, with the UN uh, human rights system. And third, it also uh, urged the government to ensure full, safe, and unhindered access to humanitarian aid uh, on the basis of need and in accordance with the humanitarian principles. Um, the resolution is one example, very strong, but is not the only one. Um, in, examples of the EU engagement in the UN context. Along with this, uh, the um, EU has consistently supported uh, the mandate of the Special Rapporteur for Human Rights, um, on human rights, which has been, I mean, uh, whose mandate has been agreed um, not so long ago, uh, but so far uh, its action has been hindered by uh, the authorities of DPRK. 
and the EU supports strongly that uh, the UN Special Rapporteur is given access and uh, it can um, actually can do its work uh, with respect uh, to human rights. Also, um, in particular, we would like the authorities to grant him, as I said, full access to the country, free, full, and unimpeded access to the country. Um, the European Union currently also regrets the fact that uh, DPRK authorities uh, are not giving any follow-up to the recommendation of the Universal Periodic Review exercise. Um, DPRK did this, uh, this exercise in 2009, and it seems that there were some openings with respect to some of these recommendations, but it now appears that they are rather rejecting to implement uh, this recommendation. And this is also uh, a source of concern for the um, European Union. Finally, uh, still in the context of the UN, there have been proposal for certain quarters to create, to establish a UN Commission of Inquiry. Uh, the European Union considered that for the moment uh, this solution is not the best in the sense that the Special Rapporteur um, should be given the time first to uh, do its work, I mean to start and have this free access and do its work before establishing another UN bodies, um, which also risks not to be effective. So this is just to give you an idea, a quick uh, idea, uh, a brief overview of what uh, the, UN, uh, the EU does in the multilateral fora and mainly in the UN. Uh, bilaterally, the EU is also um, deploying efforts to uh, promote and to uh, encourage um, DPRK uh, with respect to human rights. Uh, there is a regular dialogue at political level uh, which takes place between the EU and the PRK authorities. The last one was in um, November 2010. And in this context, the EU is always raising the issue of human rights with the authorities. So uh, it's a sort of uh, forum, bilateral forum, where human rights are uh, discuss, discussed, are raised, and our ex uh, concerns are expressed. Um, the EU would also be willing to establish a specific human rights dialogue with the authorities of DPRK. Uh, maybe you know, maybe you are aware that uh, the EU, the European Union, has many uh, the, of these kinds of dialogues with many countries. Uh, but so far, notwithstanding, I mean, this willingness, there has been no progress on this side. Um, bilaterally, another, another way, another channel, um, with respect to the uh, human rights situation in um, DPRK um, is uh, the dialogue between you and China, you and China dialogue on human rights, where uh, the EU regularly raise the issue, in particular with respect to um, the refugees. Um, and uh, though we raise the issue, it's true that Chinese authorities are rather reluctant to get into detail and uh, they rather answer or claim that they treat refugees according to international human rights uh, standards. Uh, just to complete the presentation, uh, as I said in the beginning, where is a multilateral and bilateral dimension, I would like to underline that um, the EU also provide humanitarian assistance to DPRK. Um, it is a principle, I mean, it, it is uh, common uh, for the EU, not for the EU policy, not to link this assistance to political conditions. It is an assistance which is provided um, on the basis of need. And the EU is providing this assistance since 1995, with some periods of suspension. Uh, as most recently as this summer, for example, the EU has um, launched again a one-off uh, food um, assistant to pro um, assistance program of about 10 million euros uh, to provide emergency food assistance uh, to DPRK. Uh, this program was based on a fact-finding mission which was carried out by the European Union, which assessed the need, and it was followed uh, then by the uh, implementation of the program, um, of the program itself. 
paying attention, I mean, it was a sort of conditions for the European Union, uh, paying attention that the uh, aid really reach those who more need, uh, who are more in need of it, and again, especially vulnerable, um, vulnerable categ categories. Um, so this is was just, I mean, my introduction was just meant to uh, give you an overview, and I'm sure if you have any question later, I'm very happy to answer. Um, a, brief of, a brief overview to show what the EU um, is currently doing. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you. Um, we'll move on to our next uh, panelist, Greg. Dr. Chegu, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking uh, USKI and NKDB for kindly inviting me to speak before you today. Um, I, I have to begin with a rather sad announcement. A few days ago, uh, we, we lost one of our board members who was a uh, founding co-chair of the board and very dedicated to our cause, uh, Dr. Freddie Clay, age 87. He was uh, director for the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency and also Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, uh, and also a distinguished scholar with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a truly iconic figure credited uh, for uh, having brought an end uh, to, uh, to the Cold War. Um, HRNK uh, has been around for 10 years now. It was established in October of 2001 established by a distinguished group of uh, foreign policy and human rights specialists, representing a uh, very diverse spectrum of uh, a broad spectrum of uh, political opinions and also representing a very broad spectrum of um, professional experience. This outfit was established in order to research and publish in relation to the human rights violations uh, happening in North Korea. Um, from the very onset, our guiding objectives have been to close North Korea's gulags, to open North Korea's borders, to inform North Korea's citizens, to foster good economic principles, to feed the hungry in North Korea, and to link development assistance to North Korea to tangible improvements in the regime's human rights record. Uh, very briefly, uh, I'm going to uh, mention uh, the nine publications that we have produced over the years taken on the issue of abductees taken by North Korea and earlier the 180,000 uh, South Koreans taken during the Korean War, uh, Korean Japanese who returned to North Korea never to be allowed to leave, 500 South Korean POWs and foreign abductees South Koreans taken after the Korean War have been included in this number. Uh, one of our reports, <coughs> the Kim Jong-il Can We Hope for Change, has looked at prospects following um, a possible regime change or some changes occurring in North Korea. The report was authored by, a, um, by an elite North Korean defector, Mr. Kim Kwang Jin, who was our resident fellow here in Washington, D.C. We have addressed the issue of uh, human trafficking uh, affecting North Korean women defectors. We have also addressed North Korea's failure to protect its own citizens. Um, we have looked into legal strategies for protecting human rights in North Korea, and we have also looked at the North Korean refugee crisis and the famine uh, that affected uh, North Korea in the mid to late 1990s. Uh, our first report was authored by uh, David Hawk, who is here in the audience today. Uh, this report is credited for having brought uh, massive worldwide attention to this issue of the political prisoner camps in North Korea. Uh, unfortunately, there are deniers to this date, uh, and, and this report has, uh, has been tremendously instrumental in bringing attention to this issue. As you all know, in the United States, we have a North Korean Human Rights Act passed in 2004, reauthorized in 2008, um, that basically provides uh, for responsible humanitarian assistance to North Koreans in North Korea, uh, provides grants to private nonprofit organizations to promote democracy, rule of law, and the market economy, um, aims to increase the availability of information inside North Korea, and also aims to provide assistance to North Korean defectors. 
also pursuant to the North Korean Human Rights Act. We, as you all know, we have a special envoy for North Korean human rights. In this case, Ambassador Robert King, extraordinarily dedicated, extraordinarily qualified, with um, an, an amazing background, not only in North Korean human rights, but also in uh, Eastern European human rights, has authored a remarkable history of the Romanian Communist Party in the early 1980s, worked uh, for a long time as Chief of Staff to the late Congressman Lantos, who was himself a Holocaust, well, who was a Holocaust survivor who uh, had a narrow escape from the camps owing to the help of Swedish diplomat Raul Wallenberg. Um, mindful of the North Korean Human Rights Act, the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea has submitted 10 policy recommendations to the attention of the Obama administration. The first of which being that we need to broaden U.S. policy on North Korea to include bilateral and multilateral approaches to human rights issues. Um, we are aware and that um, a lot of issues affect uh, North Korean refugees in China. North Korean refugees in China are not granted refugee status, political refugee status. They forcibly return to North Korea where they face harsh punishment in extreme cases, uh, even death, especially in particular cases where they came across representatives of alternative systems such as Christian missionaries or South Koreans. China continues to refuse to grant political refugee status to these North Koreans. Um, the reason provided being that they're not political but economic refugees. As we all know, the causes of their defection are, are not exclusively economic. They're political, social, and economic. It is the very system of North Korea that forces them to leave their homeland. We have also proposed the establishment of a first asylum program for North Korean refugees. Uh, and um, the number of North Korean refugees in South Korea may be low, 23,000. Uh, by comparison, for example, to Cuba, um, North Korea has a population of 24 million. Uh, there are 23,000 North Korean refugees in South Korea. The, the number, in the case of Cuba, for 10 million Cubans, 1 million Cubans around the Miami area. Um, well, even compared to the relatively low numbers of um, North Korean refugees in South Korea, those numbers are even lower here. We have fewer than 130 North Korean refugees for a variety of reasons. We have proposed, we have suggested that we fully implement the North Korean Human Rights Act, and uh, we have also um, recommended that we provide responsible, fully, and adequately monitored food aid that, reaching the, that reaches the rightful recipients, the hungry in North Korea. Um, we have insisted that we need to provide essential information directly to the people of North Korea, and we seem to have some positive signs that this has been happening for the past few years based on um, data collected by the Broadcasting Board of Governors, based on uh, interviews conducted with defectors, of those defectors interviewed, about 30% had listened to foreign broadcasting, foreign broadcasting also including the stations based in South Korea. Um, we've also heard about the, the new means of getting information uh, into North Korea and having this information reach North Koreans, uh, DVDs, CD-ROMs, um, USBs, thumb drives. Uh, we we have recommended that we need to seek a full accounting of foreign citizens held in North Korea against their will. We have also insisted that we need to stop the flow of North Korea's ill-gotten wealth. And we have also pointed out that we need to begin preparations for political trans transition and possibly a humanitarian crisis in North Korea. Um, these recommendations um, could certainly uh, serve um, as, as we aim to put together, could be instrumental in putting together a roadmap towards the improvement of the human rights situation in North Korea. And nevertheless, we face challenges that all of us are aware of. Uh, first and foremost, there is North Korea's adamant refusal to admit to its human rights violations then there is the difficulty of reaching the people of North Korea. 
despite some recent pro progress made uh, through uh, public broadcasting, as uh, mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Um, also, human rights are generally assigned a lower priority than other issues in talks with North Korea. And we also see a lot of competing international issues. Of course, this year the big story has been uh, the Middle East and the changes that have happened in uh, Tunisia, in Egypt, or in Libya. There are always some other competing international issues. And there is also a bit of compassion fatigue that appears to affect, in particular, our views on what is happening in North Korea. While here in Washington, D.C., through uh, wonderful events such as today's event put together by, uh, by SICE and uh, NKDB, we are aware of the situation in North Korea, um, that there is a relatively low level of public awareness of the North Korean human rights situation as far as the American public outside Washington, D.C. is concerned, and possibly as far as the, the American public outside areas with a higher concentration of Korean Americans is concerned. Um, all of us are aware that we continue to face great difficulty in obtaining current information. Even, for example, defector interviews included in reports that are to be published in the coming weeks and in the coming months um, are based on interviews with defectors who took a while to reach South Korea or third countries, and thus this information may be a little bit dated, and yes, nev yet nevertheless the best that we have to operate with. And if our colleagues dealing with humanitarian assistance think that they suffer from a lack of adequate resources, I think that the, the human rights community is not in better shape. We could certainly benefit from better resources allotted to uh, dealing with the human rights situation in North Korea. Um, what are some of the things that we can do to address these challenges? Um, after the publication of our uh, report, uh, Failure to Protect, uh, Václav Havel, former president of the Czech Republic and uh, an anti-communist defector himself, uh, the former prime minister of Norway, Mr. Bondovic, Elie Wiesel, um, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, um, wrote a piece in the New York Times, and they were very uh, closely involved with the publication of this report. And uh, there is a very interesting quote from, uh, from that piece that Kim Jong-il has proven that the international community's restraint in openly discussing North Korea's treatment of its own people did not yield compromise on the nuclear issue. It merely allowed him to decouple the two issues. We clearly need to address human rights as a top priority on a par with other very important key issues. Of course, the question that we always ask is how much of what we do uh, actually gets to the people of North Korea. This is a challenge that we have discussed. We, we need to give very serious consideration to ways and means to uh, try to uh, get information to North Koreans, educate them on what human rights means and what human rights are about. And in uh, this morning's session, we basically uh, stated that it, it is not very clear and probably, most likely, North Koreans are not aware of what human rights means. Um, we, uh, we always experience challenges when it comes to sources, sources of information. Of course, one great source of information is defectors and conducting interviews with defectors in South Korea, here, and other third countries. Um, we have much better sources now compared to um, uh, eight years ago when uh, David Hawke's uh, report was first published, um, there is um, a uh, higher number of defectors in South Korea. What we have now is also former prison guards who um, were involved with the camps who provide um, a, a different angle to the area that we research. And we also have better satellite imagery 
than we had a few years ago, which also enables us to take our research, in particular our research on the political prisoner camps, one step further. Um, certainly, uh, there are several things that we can consider. Some of the media organizations employ stringers based in North Korea, North Koreans who use Chinese cell phones to be in touch with these media organizations providing current information from inside North Korea. I think we need to better coordinate with outfits such as Daily NK or Radio Free Asia who have this type of sources. There is need for better coordination between research institutions and such media organizations. Um, Professor Andrew Yeo is in the audience today. He talks about uh, building bridges between the humanitarian assistance community and the human rights community. HRNK has been a bridge builder from the very beginning. Once again, we, we reflect a very broad diversity of opinion. I, I also think that we, we need to enhance our, our dialogue between human rights organizations and humanitarian assistance organizations with an in-country presence in North Korea. There is a lot we can learn from each other. For example, when it comes to the, the food crisis in North Korea, uh, this has to do with the, the current conditions, with environmental degradation. Of course, it has a lot to do with North Korea's political system. It has to do with North Korea's social classification system, Songbun, the way resources and food rations are distributed. Um, sometimes, um, we, uh, well, recently, just, just a few weeks ago, there is uh, an article by a very highly respected scholar who said that based on interviews he had conducted with recent defectors, it was no longer the case that three generations of the same family were being held in the camps. Well, if one talks to uh, David Hawke, he will tell you that what happens is that many or most of the recent defectors come from a section of the Yodok prisoner camp that is for singles, and thus it is very likely that they didn't come into contact with family quarters and families kept at the camps. Uh, we hear many times that, and this has been an ongoing issue for a while, does food aid reach the hungry? It does, it doesn't. I think that one thing we need to do is also to compare notes. Basically, to, to make sure that the defectors interviewed who state that they did not see any food aid at all, uh, actually come from provinces and counties where such food aid was disbursed, just, just to make sure that we are operating with the right data. Um, we, we certainly need to network, we need to establish international partnerships and coalitions, and uh, that the International Coalition to Stop Crimes Against Humanity in North Korea is one such very worthy coalition, which we joined in uh, early September of this year. Um, we, we do need to engage in a very robust public information campaign here, in addition to the, the advocacy, the research, and the publications that we produce. Um, we need to inform the American public and the public in third countries on the human rights violations that have been happening in North Korea. And one issue that we haven't mentioned at all today is that of hereditary succession of uh, Kim Jong-il's son, Kim Jong-un, possibly becoming the future uh, ruler of North Korea. At a different event yesterday, uh, Mr. Peter Chong of uh, Justice for uh, North Korea mentioned a very important issue that at times in history when such grave violations have happened, the perpetrators tried to erase the evidence. And we need to start thinking about this. We need to start thinking not only about reporting on the past and current human rights violations, we need to start talking about prevention. It is very clear that despite being Swiss educated, um, Kim Jong-un is definitely no enlightened character is probably more, more similar to, to uh, Bebe Dok uh, or to, to Bokasa, who himself had gone to a Christian school, after all, in his younger days. All indication shows clearly that it is that the hardliners, the hawks, who are behind this succession. And uh, we have been warning about this. We have been talking about this for months, if not for, for over a year now, and we have had recent evidence that lethal force has been used against defectors who are shot on sight. We need to look into these issues, we need to report into these issues, we need not only the international 
public opinion to know about this. We need the North Korean regime to know that we are watching. And we, we know that these per perpetrations might happen, and we need to know that we are aware. They need to know that we will do everything in our power to prevent such violations from happening. Um, since uh, I seem to be running out of time, I would like to remind the, the audience that, um, of course, one of the most effective means of uh, having input into the UN political process is to provide well-founded well -founded information to the Special Rapporteur on the human rights situation in North Korea. And it goes without saying that whenever applicable, we have a duty to inform the State Department, in particular the Special Envoy for North Korean human rights issues. Last but not least, um, I think it is very important that we start thinking about success stories. And uh, Dr. Roberta Cohen, the, the co-chair of HRNK, has often said that um, what we don't have in North Korea is success stories. There are other brutal, oppressive regimes where still lists names of political prisoners can be obtained. This is not the case in North Korea. Six, seven, eight years after some North Korean journalists died in a political uh, prisoner camp, uh, Reporters Without Borders finally receives a report about their deaths in the camps. Certainly, we do need success stories, and so far we've had only six such successful cases. The five abductees released in 2002, and then uh, the husband of Hitomi Soga, uh, U.S. deserter Charles Jenkins, who was himself allowed to leave in 2004. Um, there is probably an opportunity to try to identify individual abductees rather than political prisoners, because the likelihood of obtaining political prisoners lists is certainly much lower. Um, at the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, we have received a couple of such requests from South Korea to try and find out, find out more about the whereabouts of South Korean nationals abducted from Europe. We may have an opportunity to have such a success story, an opportunity provided by the case of Shin Suk Cha that we all take deep interest in. Uh, Dr. Oki Lam, her husband, was here this morning. Uh, one last remark pertaining to uh, such success stories is that as human rights experts and advocates, we need to know how to make the distinction between a campaign to secure the release of an individual and a campaign to secure full disclosure and the release of all abductees. Uh, I would like to conclude by engaging in a shameless act of self-promotion. Uh, whenever you get a chance, please visit our website and social media, which is up and running and trying to keep our good friends informed on what is happening in this area of human rights in North Korea. Thank you very much. I look forward to the Q&A. Greg, thank you. Um, in Washington, D.C., there's nothing that's very shameless, all right? So uh, way to plug your organization. Um, I think we'll move to uh, Ben. Well, thank you uh, very much. Um, b being British, I guess I'm a little bit more understated and, and less shameless, but, uh, but the, the uh, promotion is still hopefully implicit in what I, what I share. Um, how, can I get my... Uh, is there a way of... I think it's on its way. Is it on its way? Well, while it uh, travels through the whatever system it's, it's called, can I begin by uh, saying what a, a real privilege and, oh, wonderful, um, a real privilege and pleasure it is to be here today. I want to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, excellent uh, conference. Uh, and it's a particular privilege to be, and I'm very conscious of being, in a room full of people who uh, have worked on North Korea, or indeed come from North Korea, uh, and, and many people who have worked on North Korea far longer than I have. But I hope that the thoughts that I share with you today will be uh, of uh, some value. Uh, in many ways, they reinforce some of the points that Greg has made, and I, uh, I want to 100% uh, endorse uh, all of the points he's made, and particularly the point uh, about the need for coordination. Uh, <coughs> I think the premise that I come from uh, in uh, what I share this, this afternoon is that 
the situation in North Korea is so bad that we need to use every possible tool that we have uh, at our disposal. And I uh, want to offer a, a suggested coordinated strategy revolving around uh, what I've sort of loosely grouped as three I's, investigation, information, uh, and uh, interaction. We heard this morning about the human rights situation, and I'm not going to uh, rehearse uh, in detail uh, just how bad it is, but I do just want to start by reminding uh, you of the words of the former UN Special Rapporteur, Vitit Munterborn, in his final report, who described North Korea as in its own category, with human rights violations that are, quote, harrowing and horrific, egregious and endemic, and systematic and pervasive. North Korea's human rights record, he concludes, is abysmal. The uh, Times newspaper in uh, London uh, on the 27th of September 2010 uh, carried an editorial uh, entitled Slave State, which concluded that, and I, I quote, the condition of the people of North Korea ranks among the great tragedies of the past century. The despotism that consigns them to that state is one of its greatest crimes. And so my starting point uh, is that what is happening in North Korea, and particularly what is happening in the prison camps, amounts to crimes against humanity. Uh, and therefore, uh, I believe, uh, along with uh, many other, an increasing number of others, that uh, those crimes against humanity, which are violations of international law, uh, need to be investigated. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Christian Solidarity Worldwide published a report uh, called North Korea, A Case to Answer, A Call to Act, uh, which uh, makes the uh, case uh, for uh, a UN inquiry. And since then, we have continued to advocate for the establishment of a United Nations Commission of Inquiry. Uh, and as uh, Greg mentioned and Suzanne mentioned this morning, uh, earlier this year, well, in September this year, along with 40 human rights organizations from across the world, we established the International Coalition to Stop Crimes Against Humanity, or ICNK. Uh, and it is very exciting, I think, to see that coalition, including the three largest human rights organizations in the world, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, and the Paris-based uh, International Federation for Human Rights, uh, uh, FIDH, uh, along with human rights organizations uh, made up of uh, North Korean defectors, made up of South Koreans based in Seoul, but also groups that have not traditionally worked on North Korea, from countries as, as diverse as Bangladesh and uh, Paraguay and uh, Brazil uh, and across Asia, Latin America, Europe uh, and North America uh, have come together to establish this coalition. Uh, and just to uh, uh, engage in a little bit of un-British self-promotion. Um, you, if you want to know uh, a bit more detail about uh, what uh, we are proposing in this campaign, I uh, authored a, uh, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal uh, in September, on September the 9th, headline calling for action on North Korean crimes. Uh, and I'd be very happy if anyone wants a copy of that, uh, if you give me your email afterwards, uh, very happy to share that with you. The European Parliament has already passed a resolution uh, calling for a commission of inquiry. Uh, Vitit Munterborn, who I quoted a moment ago, uh, said uh, uh, in one of his uh, reports, uh, he didn't specifically call for a commission of inquiry, but he came as close as uh, it's possible to, to do. He said, uh, it is incumbent upon the national authorities and the international community to address the impunity factor. He urged the UN to consider, quote, whether the issue of violations will be taken up at some stage at the pinnacle of the system within the totality of the UN framework. And he's called on the international community to, quote, mobilize the totality of the UN to promote and protect human rights in the country, support processes which concretize responsibility and accountability for human rights violations, and an end to impunity. Uh, so I think uh, the first uh, uh, point in a strategy is that these crimes against humanity uh, must be uh, investigated. 
Uh, and the ICNK will be developing a strategy over the coming year. The European Union and Japan are the co-authors of the UN General Assembly resolution on North Korea. Uh, and so it's essential that uh, they uh, support this, but then there will be a need for uh, as many other member states in the UN to support it uh, as well. One of the things that uh, uh, we hope will come in the next few months is uh, recently we had, uh, we were privileged to host Shin Dong Yuk, who's uh, with us here today uh, in London. And one of the many meetings that we had in London was with uh, a prominent jurist called Sir Geoffrey Nice. Uh, who's very nice if you're not a dictator. <laughs> um, but uh, he was the uh, chief prosecutor in the trial of Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, and when he heard uh, Shin Dong Yuk's story and looked into the situation in North Korea a bit more, he agreed to uh, co author uh, an op ed with Professor William Shabas, who's one of the leading uh, international authorities on uh, uh, human rights uh, law. And so uh, we anticipate that will come out uh, sometime in the next few months, and that will help uh, build the case. And we want to build up uh, the support from international uh, jurists, international NGOs, uh, policymakers, parliamentarians, uh, and others. Uh, crucial to uh, that whole process uh, is the importance of information. And I, I believe we need uh, information in this uh, effort to address crimes against humanity in North Korea. Information both coming out of North Korea, which is essential uh, to bring about a commission of inquiry, but also, of course, information going into North Korea. And I'll come back to that uh, a little later, but the importance of radio, the importance of uh, uh, the balloons that go in, uh, DVDs, thumb drives, uh, any means of getting information in as well as out uh, is really essential. Uh, and a key part of getting information out is providing the defectors who have come out of the country over the years with opportunities to speak to the media, to speak in conferences uh, like this. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing Kang Chol Kwan shortly. Uh, we've hosted a number of defectors in uh, the United Kingdom uh, and in Europe. Uh, we've had hearings in the European Parliament. Uh, this is a picture of two defectors uh, at a hearing last year. Uh, we've had hearings in the British Parliament. Uh, and I think uh, those uh, kind of hearings are really important. So too are the kind of reports that Greg has referred to, and particularly, I think, David Hawke's uh, report, uh, Hidden Gulag. But now I come to the third part of this uh, three-pronged approach, uh, investigation, information, and interaction. I had the privilege uh, about a year ago of traveling to North Korea with two British parliamentarians, Lord Alton and Baroness Cox. And this was their third visit uh, to North Korea. Lord Alton and Baroness Cox are two of the most outspoken uh, parliamentarians in the British Parliament on human rights generally. Uh, including on North Korea. Uh, and what is really interesting about their approach is that they have not uh, compromised what they've said about the human rights situation in North Korea uh, one bit. If you read any of their speeches in the House of Lords, in debates on human rights, uh, they have been uh, as outspoken as, uh, as one could hope them to be. Uh, and yet, very strangely, the North Koreans have invited them back uh, uh, now uh, three times. And I had the opportunity to accompany them last year. The way I would describe their approach, uh, they, they have used the term critical engagement. But I think sometimes the term engagement can be uh, open to uh, misinterpretation and misunderstanding. Uh, when I was in Seoul just a few months ago and had a meeting with Kang Chol Hwan, I described what we had done on our visit to North Korea. And I used the term critical engagement. But the translator that I had, who was an excellent translator, very wisely changed it. And in Korean, she told me afterwards, uh, she didn't use engagement. She, she used uh, a literal uh, translation saying, uh, raising human rights issues face to face with the North Korean regime. And that actually summed up what we were doing far better than the term uh, engagement. Uh, I want to uh, just, if I may, quote uh, David Hawke briefly 
uh, because uh, David uh, wrote an excellent report, actually launched, I think, here at SAIS last year, uh, Pursuing Peace While Advancing Rights, the untried approach to North Korea. Uh, and David says, for the last 20 years, the paradigm that has guided approaches to North Korea is that the pursuit of peace requires that human rights concepts be kept off the table and that North Korea's potential partners affect a deaf, dumb, blind, and mute posture towards the systematic, severe, and widespread human rights violations. Uh, he continues, uh, and I, uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, summarize it. Uh, he concludes by saying, uh, the two contrasting approaches, negotiations, reconciliation, and engagement in the pursuit of peace in ways that rebuff human rights considerations, or alternatively, the raising of human rights concerns about North Korea in the absence of an attempt to reconcile and engage, have both failed. There is an alternative that would pursue peace, engagement, and reconciliation in association with the promotion and protection of human rights, a fundamentally new and untried approach. It's what uh, Lord Alton has termed Helsinki with a Korean face. Uh, in the days of the Soviet Union, when I was just a few years old, but uh, some people in the room may, uh, may have even been involved in, in this, uh, we pursued the Helsinki process with the Soviet Union, where we were as tough as it was possible to be. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher had uh, the missiles lined up. Uh, we, there was no sense that they were compromising with the Soviet Union. But they sat down face to face uh, on occasions with the Soviet le leaders uh, and raised the plight of dissidents, raised human rights issues. Uh, and I believe uh, that that is what uh, is needed uh, with North Korea. Uh, so when we went last year, we had meetings at uh, senior levels uh, with uh, people like uh, Speaker Chete Bok of the Supreme People's Assembly uh, and, uh, and other senior uh, officials. And interestingly, uh, we also had Speaker Chete Bok come to the UK uh, earlier this year. Uh, and on his visit to the UK, uh, he was exposed to some very direct uh, questions and uh, challenges. Uh, there was a meeting in Parliament where, uh, I don't want to give too much background detail, but uh, all I would say is perhaps I had a hand in uh, helping this uh, from behind the scenes, but a member of Parliament uh, attended the meeting and he brought with him as his personal guest uh, a North Korean defector, uh, uh, Kim Joo Il, based in London, uh, and invited Kim Joo Il to address Speaker Che Tae Bok uh, and to ask him some questions. Well, the North Korean delegation were furious and uh, they, they panicked and they, the ambassador actually walked out but then had to walk back in again because Che Tae Bok was still there. Um, and, but it was a direct face-to-face uh, -face attempt to raise these issues. He also had a meeting with the Speaker of the House of Commons, uh, who is a very uh, strongly committed to human rights. Uh, I've worked with him very closely on Burma before he became Speaker. And the Speaker of the House of Commons uh, was very uh, clever. Uh, he agreed to do the meeting on the condition that it would be a private meeting and therefore would not give the regime uh, a propaganda opportunity. It wouldn't uh, give them some kind of legitimacy. Uh, there would be no publicity, there was, there was no uh, press release, it would be in a totally private meeting, unofficial meeting. Uh, but in that meeting, he also raised uh, the concerns that we have. Uh, and there's no tangible evidence that this is leading to a change now, of course not. Uh, but I think we need to take every opportunity we can to attempt to penetrate the mindsets uh, of uh, people in the regime uh, when we have the opportunity to do so. Uh, in our uh, visit, we took with us stacks of uh, human rights reports, uh, UN uh, resolutions, European Parliament resolutions, uh, uh, Human Rights Watch uh, reports, uh, and uh, it was a bit like uh, going into a, a courtroom. We, we went into every single meeting with a big pile of papers, and we, we left these with every official. Uh, they didn't refuse to accept, accept them. They did take them. They didn't refuse to let us raise these concerns. We raised them. Uh, I can't say the responses were uh, particularly enlightening. Uh, and of course, most of the time, they denied the very existence of the Kwan Lee So, the, the prison camps. Uh, but uh, at least we had a chance to 
uh, raise them. We also took as gifts uh, a range of books to give to both uh, the, some of the universities in Pyongyang, but also to uh, senior officials that we met. And one of the particular books we brought was a biography that the British Foreign Secretary, William Haig, uh, had written uh, of William Wilberforce. Uh, and when we presented it to senior officials, we said, this is a book written by our Foreign Secretary, and they like that because it, it's a bit of protocol, uh, about one of our great parliamentarians. They like that because they're quite interested in our history. Uh, William Wilberforce, who led the campaign to end the slave trade. Uh, and in saying that, we were obviously sending a perhaps not so subtle message that uh, slavery was a concern for us. Uh, we also took copies of Karl Popper's The Open Society and Its Enemies. Uh, again, a not so subtle message, but we left these books with them. Uh, we also took Bibles, uh, Korean Bibles, which, we, uh, which are banned in North Korea. It's illegal, but we gave them to senior people uh, in the regime. Uh, of course, uh, there were times during the visit where I thought I truly walked into the pages of George Orwell's 1984, uh, and uh, it was one of the uh, strangest uh, places that I've been to. We were taken to a concert, uh, and uh, the first half was very enjoyable. The music was nice. You could almost forget where you were. Uh, the second half was pure propaganda uh, and uh, uh, images of... Uh, tanks rolling across the screen, and uh, the great leader, the dear leader, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, all of that uh, propaganda. And every time a, a missile uh, on the screen behind the orchestra, every time a missile uh, fired off, the entire audience, uh, who were mostly North Korean military, uh, broke into huge applause. Uh, the entire audience, except for three people, and I hope you know which three people they were. <laughs> um, but we actually, our minder said to us uh, uh, at the end, you know, you, you were not applauding. And Lord Alton uh, made it very plain why we were not applauding and that we did not approve of missiles firing off behind an orchestra. So again, we had an opportunity to, to challenge their mindset. Uh, I want to close with just uh, a couple of final points. In one of our meetings, and I probably shouldn't say where it was because I know we're on the record, but one of our meetings in Pyongyang, I should say in most of our meetings, we, uh, although we raised the tough human rights record uh, uh, issues very consistently and very uh, seriously and with some detail, and we cited a lot of specific cases, the tone and the atmosphere, although possibly the body language changed slightly, but the tone and atmosphere was generally uh, quite uh, diplomatic and uh, non-confrontational. But we had one meeting where the temperature rose quite significantly because the uh, person we were talking to firstly had said to us, uh, when we talked about the principle in, in the judicial process of uh, in it being innocent until proven guilty, he said, uh, no, in, in our country, when a person comes to court, we don't believe they are innocent. Uh, so we then built on that, and we started to raise questions about the prison camps and about public executions. Uh, and he denied the executions, and he denied the existence of the prison camps. We gave the example of Yodok. He said, no, no, I've been to Yodok. It's a nice village. There's no prison camp there. And then we said, then he suddenly, he became quite aggressive, and he said, well, where are you getting this information about prison camps and executions from? Uh, is it from uh, Americans? And we said, uh, no, it's not from Americans. Is it from South Koreans? No, it's not from South Koreans. We said it's from people who have survived the prison camps who we have met, and we've met uh, a good number of them. And then he said, ah, he said, well, these people, they are, they are liars, and they are criminals who have escaped from the prison camps, <laughs> which he'd said didn't exist. And, uh, and so Lord Alton clearly was having, had had enough of this, and... He looked this guy straight in the eye with, um, I would say, a kind of anger that I hadn't seen in him during the rest of the visit. And he said to this guy, how can you possibly say uh, that these people are criminals when we know, for example, of the case of Shin dong Yuk, who was born in a prison camp? He said, how can somebody be born a criminal? And this guy froze, and there was a, a, an electrifying few 
maybe only a few seconds. It felt like much longer, but a few seconds of silence, and none of us were quite sure what was going to happen next. Uh, and then he just said, shall we continue with, uh, with our tour <laughs> um, of what he was showing us? Uh, but I felt that it's not going to make a difference today. But by having those kind of conversations, even with, he was actually not that senior a person, but even with people at whatever level, having that kind of conversation that they probably never had in their life before uh, has to be worthwhile uh, to, in, a, in an attempt to penetrate their mindset, to let them know that we know, as Greg said, at every opportunity, letting the regime know uh, that the world is watching and it will not let them uh, get away with what they're doing. Uh, let me uh, close with just two final quotes. Uh, first from the former British Prime Minister Tony Blair, uh, and then from Lord Alton. Tony Blair said this, and please uh, don't take this as a critique of any particular side of politics. I think it's a critique of uh, the Western world, although he's referring to progressive uh, politics. He says, and Tony Blair, of course, was from uh, the progressive side of politics. He says, the biggest scandal in progressive politics is that you do not have people with placards out on the street regarding North Korea. This is a disgusting regime. The people there are kept in a form of slavery, 23 million of them, and no one protests. The left has two impulses which come into conflict with each other, through, through both of these, though both of these impulses are perfectly good. One is peace, and the other is intervention to help people. Peace is great, but if you're living with a tyrannical regime, you don't have much peace. And then Lord Alton says this in his first debate in the House of Lords on North Korea in 2003, which was actually the debate that led to him being invited to visit North Korea. Uh, he says, the threat to international security posed by North Korea may best be considered by way of pernicious actions against its own citizens. North, Koreans, North Korea's Stalinist dictatorship has treated its own people with unbelievable brutality and viciousness. By championing the cause of those who are suffering in North Korea, the international community will create the conditions for the establishment of democracy. Learning the lessons of the Helsinki process, we must do nothing to license the regime in Pyongyang to commit further atrocities, but we should enter negotiations which guarantee human rights, such as the free exchange of people and religious liberties. By linking the present crisis with human rights violations, a crisis can be turned into an opportunity. To do nothing about North Korea would be the most dangerous option of all. So we need to have a commission of inquiry to investigate crimes against humanity and see where that will lead. Uh, we need to uh, improve the flow of information uh, into the country through radio and other means. Uh, we need to improve the flow of information out of the country through greater opportunities for those who have escaped from the country to share their stories and give us the information. But we also need to take all that information and wherever we can interact, interact directly with the regime uh, and look them in the eye, talk face to face, uh, and challenge them on these things. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, that's a terrific um, overview of, of your organization's activities and, and what you're doing as part of the, the coalition. Uh, now we're uh, going to our final speaker, Mr. Kang Chuan. Yeah, uh, Jungaji is 
우리만 모르고 있는 것이죠. 어, 이건 뭐냐면 국제사회나 소방세계가 어, 탈북자의 말 특히 이제 북한 주민들이 뭘 원하고 있는가에 대해서 전혀 관심이 없다. 저는 그렇게 보고 있습니다. 어, 지금 우리가 이제 논의하고자 하는 필요한 것은 뭐냐면 뭐 북한을 어떻게 지원하고 뭐 어떻게 하는 게 중요한 게 아니라 어, 김정일 정권을 어떻게 빨리 끝낼 것이냐 이걸 논의해야 되는 그 문제의 핵심이다. 저는 그렇게 보고 있고요. 그래서 김정일이 없어지지 않는 한 아무런 문제 해결 방식이 없다. 어, 그래서 어, 저는 이제 최근에 어, 북한에 관한 여러 가지 정세 정보들을 이제 종합해 본 결과 어, 더 이상 북한 동포들이 에, 북한 정권의 존재를 허용하지 않는다. 그걸 원치 않는다는 것을 제가 느끼게 됐습니다. 그래서 어, 국제사회가 그것을 어, 지원해야 될 의무가 있다고 저는 이제 보고 있습니다. 어, 최근에 이제 북한 내부에서 벌어지고 있는 그 이제 큰두 가지 문제가 있습니다. 하나는 정치적인 문제와 이제 경제적인 문제인데요. 어, 특히 이제 정치적인 문제에서 그 김정일의 어떤 그 일인 중심의 독재 권력이 와해되고 있다. 그런 이제 증조가 이제 보이고 있습니다. 그건 뭐냐면 김정일 개인의 어떤 그, 그 병, 그 아픈 것 때문에 어, 이 판단 능력이 이제 상실되고 어, 이제 활동이 이제 저하되고 있죠. 어, 그러다 보니까 자기 아들에게 권력을 줄 수밖에 없는 어, 이런 형편에 놓여 있고 권력을 주려고 하다 보니까 그 주려고 하는 이제 그 중간 다리가 필요하게 됩니다. 중간자가 그 중간자가 바로 장성택이라고 하는 그 김정일의 매제가 되겠죠. 아, 그런데 이, 이 중간의 매제라는 사람이 아주 이제 묘한 사람입니다. 어, 김정일로부터 김정은에게 권력을 완전히 넘겨줄 경우에 가장 먼저 죽을 사람은 자, 장성택입니다. 그건 과거에도 그렇게 어, 사례가 있죠. 어, 김일성에서 김정일 권력을 넘겨줄 때. 어, 그 역할을 이제 김일성의 동생인 김용주라는 어, 김정일의 삼촌이 이제 그 역할을 했는데 김정일이 집권하면서 가장 먼저 죽인 사람이 김용주입니다. 그러니까 아버지 동생을 이제 수, 그 수용소와 다름없는 이제 그런 유배지에 갖다 놓고 어, 죽을 때까지 이렇게 그 방치했습니다. 어, 이런 현상이다 보니까 <웃음> 북한의 일인 권력이 3분화되는 형태로 보이고 있습니다. 김정일, 김정은, 장성택. 아, 그러니까 이게 앞으로 북한의 정치적 권력이 불안정해지면서 어떤 식으로 변화될지 누구도 예측할 수 없는 이제 그런 단계에 가고 있고요. 아, 그런 와중에 아, 지금 이제 북한 엘리트들의 고민이 뭐냐 아주 중요한 고민이 있습니다. 아, 많은 사람들이 이제는 어, 더 이상 시간이 없다. 어, 지금 그 리비아의 카다피가 이제 그 죽으면서 어, 북한에 엄청난 충격이 지금 들어가고 있습니다. 아직까지도 북한 내부에서는 어, 카다피 사망 소식이 알려지지 않고 있습니다. 거의 어, 그만큼 충격이 크다는 얘기인데 이 카다피가 죽었다는 사실이 알려질 경우에 어, 저는 북한이 견디기 힘들 만큼 어, 어려움이 온다. 어, 이건 뭐냐면 과거에 구소련이나 중국과 같은 나라는 공산세력 들이 먼저 변화를 추구했습니다. 그 추구한 결과 어, 기득권은 살아남았고 어, 지금까지 오고 있죠. 그렇지만 그 동유럽의 많은 사회주의 국가들은 오히려 기득권 세력이 개혁개방을 고부함으로 인해서 체제가 완전히 바뀌었습니다. 그러니까 그 공산 세력이 완전히 이제 없어진 것이죠. 이걸 북한 엘리트 그룹이 알고 있습니다. 그래서 어떻게 하나 중국식의 개혁개방을 어, 해야 된다. 그런데 김정일은 뭐냐면 최근의 정보에 따르면 카다피 사망 이후에 북한의 노동당 국가안전보위부 인민군 군부 어, 주요 간부들을 놓고 충성 쇠약을 했다고 합니다. 어떤 시련이 와도 김정일과 국면을 같이 하겠다는 소약을 다 이제 하게 됩니다. 이건 뭐냐면 어, 그만큼 위기가 가중되고 있고 어, 김정일을 둘러싸고 있는 이 축구 그룹들이 어, 좀 변하고 있다는 것을 이제 알수 있다는 것이죠. 그걸 막기 위해서 김정일이 그렇게 했는데요. 어, 그런데 두 번째 위기는 이제 경제적인 위기인데 어, 사실 그 98년도 후반에 그 김대중 정부가 북한을 어, 지원 안 했으면 저는 오늘의 북한은 없다고 저는 보고 있습니다. 아, 그때 지원함으로 인해서 어, 북한 정권이 10년이 연, 연장이 됐고 연장되는 과정에 어, 극한 상황에서도 견뎌낼 수 있는 어, 어떤 그 면역이 생긴 것 같습니다. 체제 면역이. 근데 그 면역도 이제 그 운이 다 하고 있습니다. 그러니까 이명박 정부 들어서 어, 완전한 이제 그 중단을 어, 지원 중단을 했는데 
그 결과 아, 북한 내부의 엘리트들의 어떤 그 파괴적인 어떤 그 분해 그 부, 어떤 그 붕괴가 오고 있습니다. 왜냐하면 인민군 어, 연대장 대대장 그, 그 이하는 완전히 이제 빈민 그룹으로 지금 전락이 되고 있습니다. 먹을 게 없습니다. 그게 점점 더 올라가고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 북한의 경제적인 압박을 가할수록 어, 북한의 권력 집단은 굉장히 이제 그 와이드될 수밖에 없다. 어, 이런 와중에 북한이 뭐였냐면 어, 2009년도 11월에 그 화폐 개혁을 했습니다. 이 화폐 개혁의 목적은 어, 현금이 고갈되는 북한의 권력 집단의 이 자산을 분리기 위해서 시장의 돈을 뺏어오겠다. 이제 그런 발상을 한 측면이 있고 어, 두 번째는 어, 시장 자체가 이제 위험해지다 보니까 이 시장을 없애겠다. 그런 두 가지 목적으로 했다고 봅니다. 그 결과 어, 북한 정권은 이제 10년 갈수 있는 어, 그 여력을 어, 1년으로 단축시켰다. 저는 그렇게 보고 있습니다. 어, 합해 개혁은 이제 북한의 엘리트 계층은 물론이고요. 최하층의 그룹까지도 완전히 돌아서게 만들어놨습니다. 지금. 그래서 이 화폐 개혁의 후유증이 아직까지 지금 오고 있다 저는 그렇게 보고 있습니다. 더 이상 이제 회복 불능 상태에 와 있죠. 그러다 보니까 이제는 북한의 김정일 정권이 마지막 수단으로 지금 취하고 있는 것이 북한의 인력을 통한 외화벌이를 지금 추구하고 있습니다. 그래서 최근에 갑자기 북한에서 파견되는 해외 근로자들의 숫자가 엄청나게 증가하고 있습니다. 지금 중국에 매일 수백 명씩 넘어오고 있습니다. 탈북자가 아니고요. 일할로 넘어오고 있습니다. 이 북한 근로자들을 노예화시킨 이 외화벌이가 지금 북한의 유일한 어, 수단으로 오고 있는데 아, 이것은 저는, 저는 어, 긍정적으로 보고 있습니다. 왜냐하면 많은 사람들이 나오게 됨으로 인해서 어, 현실에 눈에, 눈을 뜨고 있기 때문에 아, 이거는 이제 좋은 현상이죠. 어, 그리고 어, 이 북한 내부의 그 시장이 다시 확대되고 있습니다. 권력이 악화됨으로 인해서 시장이 확대되면서 어, 북한 주민들의 어떤 그 이, 생존 능력이 좀더 높아지고 있다는 것은 좀 이제 어, 중요한 이제 요인인 것 같고요. 어, 저는 그래서 어, 이제는 북한의 김정일 정권을 그 말로 하거나 뭐 대화를 하거나 뭐 경제적인 지원을 하거나 어, 그런 것들이 별로 의미가 없다. 어, 강제적인 압박을 가해야만 어, 그 정권을 바뀔 수가 있다. 어, 저는 그렇게 보고 있습니다. 어, 저는 그래서 북한 정권을 압박할 수 있는 네 가지를 제가 찾아봤는데요. 어, 하나는 뭐냐면 그 탈북자 문제입니다. 탈북자 문제인데요. 어, 사실 어, 미국 정부나 한국 정부나 마음만 먹으면 어, 중국 정부에 건의를 해서 탈북자의 강제 북송을 막을 수가 있습니다. 어, 사실 미국도 그런 힘이 있고 한국도 그런 힘이 있습니다. 그런데 어, 중국이란 나라가 워낙 거대하고 힘이 파워가 생기고 말을 안 듣기 때문에 말을 해봤자 안 된다. 뭐 그런 논리가 좀 지배적인 것 같고요. 어, 그러다 보니까 어, 제가 예전에 그 부시 대통령 만났을 때 제가 제일 강조한 게 그겁니다. 대통령께서 중국의 후진다고 전화해서 탈북자의 강제 부속만 막아주면 북한의 변화는 온다. 그런데 그제 말을 어떻게 했는지 모르겠지만 어, 그런 노력들은 안한것 같습니다. 만약 그때 미국 정부가 중국을 압박을 해서 탈북자의 강제 북송을 막았더라면 지금 북한이 이렇게 견딜 수가 없습니다. 어, 마찬가지로 한국 정부 역시 그런 노력이 없습니다. 뭐 말로는 한마디씩 하고 있지만 어, 공식적으로 중국 정부에 탈북자를 북한에 보내지 말아라. 이런 요구를 하지 않습니다. 저는 그런 요구를 왜안 하는지 저는 이해할 수가 없어요. 가장 중요한 문제인데 가장 하찮게 보고 있기 때문에 북한 문제는 풀릴 수가 없습니다. 지금 북한은 그 주민 전체가 이제는 봉기할 태세가 돼 있어요. 하지만 그 봉기할 경우에 리비아와는 비교가 안될 만큼 살인 학살이 옵니다. 모든 군대와 권력을 다 가져있기 때문에 봉기할 경우에 다 죽여버립니다. 그냥 뭐 엄청난 그런 학살이 오기 때문에 어 그런 이제 여력이 없는데 만에 하나 봉기를 했다가 실패할 경우에 도망갈 테러가 있다. 도망갈 길이 있다. 중국에 갔지만 북한으로 돌아, 돌아 보내지 않는다. 이런 확신만 서면요. 봉기가 일어납니다. 지금은 테러가 없다 보니까 이 사람들은 갈 데가 없어요. 봉기하고 싶어도 봉기할 수도 없고 도망갈 수도 없고 그러니까 이 도망갈 수 있는 길만 열리면 북한은 그날로 이제 변화가 되는데 이러한 중요한 고리를 우리가 방치하면서 무슨 북한 문제 백날 얘기해봤자 저는 아무 소용없다. 저는 그렇게 보고 있고요. 그래서 
저는 한국 정부와 특히 미국 정부가 중국과 대화해야 된다. 그 중요한 대화의 우제는 탈북자의 강제북성을 막는 것이다. 이거 말고는 북한하고 중국하고 대화할 거리가 있겠습니까? 그리고 두 번째는 그 인권 문제인데요. 뭐 북한의 수용소가 있고 뭐 고문하고 다 하는 얘기입니다. 김정일을 부끄럽게 해야 됩니다. 이 수용소를 계속 알려, 알려서 이 수용소 문제 때문에 김정일이 어, 더 이상 견딜 수 없도록 폭로하고 압박해서 이 인권 문제를 북한은 이제 그 고립시키는 이제 그런 역할이 이제 어, 필요할 수 있고요. 그리고 어, 지금 많은 분들이 북한을 이제 지원하고 있습니다. 뭐, 월드비전도 있고 또 아까 우리 김은수 지사님께서 어, 경기도에서 북한을 지원하고 있는데 어, 저는 제발 북한을 지원할 때 인도주의란 말은 빼자 그렇게 권유하고 싶습니다. 어떻게 비인도적인 국가에 인도적인 지원이 가능합니까? 인도주의적인 지원이 아니라 북한 정권 지원이죠. 말, 바, 말은 반대로 해야죠. 그리고 그 모니터링 한다고 그러는데 모니터링 불가능합니다. 뭐 준다고 이제 쇼를 합니다. 이렇게 뭐 준신 하게 되면 인민들이 나와서 받아가는 힘내는 내죠. 그러면 뒤에도 다 그분들이 가게 되면 다시 다 뺏어갑니다. 이건 다 하는 얘기인데 무슨 모니터링 한다고 그런 거짓말은 좀 하지 말았으면 좋겠고요. 제대로 하려면 모니터링 요원들이 수천 명이 북한에 들어가서 지키고 앉아야 됩니다. 진짜 먹는지 다 먹을 때까지 보, 봐야죠. 그러지 않고서는 모니터링 불가능합니다. 그러면 우리가 북한 정권이 워낙 어렵기, 어렵다 보니까 이 경제적인 지원이 북한 정권을 변화시킬 수 있는 하나의 무기가 될수 있습니다. 이것을 무기화하는 것이죠. 자 경제적인 지원을 할 테니까 납북자 국군포로 보내라. 그 보내는 조건으로 잘 지원하겠다. 또 지금 남북 간 이상 가족이 지금 뭐 몇십만 명, 몇백만 명이 지금 어, 갈라진 채로 지금 수십 년간 지금 오고 있는데 뭐쌀한 십만 원줄 테니까 한 십만 명 보내라. 만나게 하자. 그런 조건으로 줄 수는 있습니다. 그리고 정치범 수용소를 없애라. 없애는 조건으로 몇십만 원더 주겠다. 그거 안 되면 말고 또 가장 중요한 문제는 북한 주민들이 굶고 있는 이유가 뭐 우리가 무슨 지원하지 않기 때문에 굶는다. 이건 잘못된 판단이죠. 김정일 정권이 중국 측에 개혁개방만 하면 그 다음 날로 굶지 않을 수가 있습니다. 그런데 그 개혁개방하게 되면 자기 정권이 무너진다고 판단하기 때문에 그걸 거부하고 있죠. 그래서 중국 측에 개혁개방을 하면 도와주겠다. 이런 케이스별로 조건 지원을 붙여서 주자 이거죠. 그래서 그게 아니면 그만두라 이거죠. 그리고 김정일 정권을 통해서 지원을 하고 있지만 잘만 하면 북한 정권을 피해서 들어갈 수 있는 길이 있습니다. 가장 중요한 방법은 과거 한국 정부가 그 에드볼린을 통해서 엄청난 그 식량과 그 라면이나 뭐 의약품을 북한으로 보낸 적이 있습니다. 저도 여덕 수용소에서 남한 정부가 보내온 이 풍선에 달린 어떤 그 삐라라든지 먹을 것이라든지 그 내복 같은 것을 받아본 적이 있어요. 그렇게 보내면 됩니다. 왕창. 지금 황해도 지역이 엄청 굶는다 그러는데 거기에 그냥 돈한 몇천억 쏟아부어가지고 보내면 돼요. 그냥. 근데 그렇게 하기 싫으면 어, 유진멜 재단의 린튼 박사님을 제가 잘 아, 아는데요. 어, 이 린튼 박사님은 어, 갈 때마다 북한 정권과 싸웁니다. 북한 정권이 자기들이 원하는 바를 들어주지 않으면 아예 길가에 누워서 어, 할 때까지 그냥 싸웁니다. 하도 진짜 싸우면 싸우, 싸우다 보니까 어, 이 린튼 박사만은 북한이 어, 병원에 가서 약을 주고 치료할 수 있는 그런 허락을 해줬습니다. 이건 뭐냐면 북한 정권하고는 싸워야지만 일이 된다는 것이죠. 그럴 싸울 자신이 없는 사람들은 도와주러 가지 말라 이겁니다. 지금 뭐 제가 보니까 뭐 한국의 대형교회에서 북한에 가가지고 무슨 쌀을 주고 온, 온다 그러는데 뭐 성비하고 온다. 그건 거짓말이죠. 그거는 어떻게 싸우지 않고 북한을 변화시켜 주겠습니까? 저는 그, 그 유진별의 린튼 모델 이런 모델을 적용해서 돕자 이거죠. 그런 식으로 이제 북한을 어, 저는 변화시키면. 가능성이 있다. 보고 있습니다. 그래서 이 마지막 이 중요한 문제는요. 결국은 이제 북한 주민들이 깨어나는 그 방법에는 방법이 없습니다. 
결국은 중동의 민주화 운동도 어떤 리더가 바뀐 것이 아니라 국민이 바뀌어서 변화된 것이죠. 그 중동의 가장 그 악질이었던 카사피도 결국은 이제 국민이 일어나서 저항한 결과에 결과로 이제 바뀌게 됐습니다. 어, 저는 이제 북한에 그런 때가 오고 있다. 대다수의 북한 주민들이 이제는 그 북한 정권에 환멸하고 있고 어, 외부 세계를 알아가고 있습니다. 그런데 아직 부족합니다. 그래서 야, 북한 내부의 그 정보의 확산. 제가 얼마 전에 어, 북한에서 오는 분도 만나서 이제 얘기를 하다 보니까 이분들이 하는 말이 뭐냐면 USB에다가 영화를 좀 담아달라. 그까지 그 메모리가 좀 높은 거, 한 16메가 이상 되게 되면요, 영화 열 편을 담을 수가 있습니다. 영화 열 편이 담긴 USB 한 장이 들어가면 그 트위터나 그 페이스북처럼 그 USB 하나가 100개, 1 0 0 0개로 복사가 됩니다. 이게 엄청납니다. 이게 안 보는 사람이 없어요. 그 USB에다가 중간 중간에 카다페가 죽어가는 장면을 담았습니다. 다 봅니다. 그렇게 되면 이걸 해야 됩니다. 라디오 보내고 USB 보내고 많은 북한 사람들이 보게 하는 겁니다. 봄으로 인해서 바뀌, 바뀌면 저는 어느 순간에 폭동이 일어납니다. 북한에. 저는 이 방법이 어, 이 북한 주민의 자유와 인권을 찾는 가장 빠른 방, 방법이다. 저는 그렇게 보고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 미국 정부나 또 한국 정부 또이 많은 인권단체들이 해야 될 일은 어, 북한 정권에 뭐쌀 주고 뭐약 주고 그것도 중요하지만 이제는 정보를 줘야 된다. 이 정보를 주는데 모두가 힘을 합치고 노력을 한다면 저는 충분히 북한 정권을 변화시킬 수 있다고 그렇게 보고 있습니다. 감사합니다. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think you've heard four uh, very interesting views. Uh, before we started late, so we're going to go just a little bit over. But uh, before we take a, a, a couple of questions, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Shin Dong Yak, uh, who Ben has talked about. Um, uh, to say just a few words, uh, Mr. Shin was born in 1982 in a prison labor colony where he escaped uh, and is the only person to, know, to have escaped from a total control zone uh, where he was tortured and imprisoned for 22 years. If, uh, if Mr. Shin can just say a few words. Ah, everyone, thank you. 아, 어제도 저 국회에서 하는 행사도 참가했었고 오늘은 사실 아, 제가 여기서 하는 북한 인권 정보 센터와 이제 이 존스 홉킨스 대학에서 하고 있는 이 행사에 아, 자원봉사로 원래 참가했었습니다. 자원봉사를 해서 이제 제가 도와드릴 일이 있으면 이렇게 도와드리려고 왔었는데 또 제가 잠깐 뭐 인사를 드릴 수 있는 기회를 주셔서 대단히 감사합니다. 그래서 이제 아, 사실. 북한 인권 정보 센터하고는 제가 이제 이 한국에 들어오자마자 인연을 맺고 아 지금까지 이제 꾸준하게 인연을 해오고 있거든요. 그래서 이제 이 북한 인권 정보 센터의 경우에는 저한테는 이제 정신적인 고향이라고 할수 있겠죠. 그래서 제가 정신적으로 고통을 받을 때에 이제 이 인권 정보 센터에서 이제 같이 저랑 옆에서 지켜주고 또 여러 가지 아뭐 어려울 때에 이제 같이 있었었기 때문에 이제 굉장히 이제 가족처럼 가족 같은 분위기에서 이제 같이 활동도 하고 있고 또 여러 가지 이제 아, 네트워크도 하고 있고요. 그래서 이제 아뭐 제가 다니면서 이제 하는 많은 얘기들은 그냥 뭐 제가 살았던 스토리라든지 아니면 뭐 북한의 정치범 수용소에 대한 얘기 굉장히 많습니다. 많아가지고 또 이제 제가 또 가장 시급하게 생각하는 일이 이제 이 정치범 수용소에 살고 있는 사람들이 아 언제 뭐 내리나 아니면 일년 후나 아니면 십년 후에 이 사람들이 언제쯤에 언제쯤에 죽게 될까 하는 건 제가 굉장히 생각하고 있거든요. 이 사람들이 언제쯤에 밖으로 해방돼서 밖으로 나올까가 아니라 이 사람들이 언제쯤에 죽게 될수 있을까 하는 걸 저는 생각으로 하고 있습니다. 그래서 제가 사실 이게 여기서 말씀하고 있는 이런 세미나나 학술적인 용어들은 제가 이해를 못 하고 사실 재미는 없습니다. 하지만은 여기서 이렇게라도 하지 않으면은 북한은 정말 그들이 저지르고 있는 이런 죄 만행 그들 이런 거에 대해서 깨끗하게 정리를 하고 깨끗하게 없애버릴 수 있을 겁니다. 여기서 이렇게 학술적으로 이렇게, 이렇게 데이터베이스를 만들어서 저장시키지 않으면은 그들은 완벽한 범죄를 저질러 가지고 전 세계가 모르게 
깜짝같이 이렇게 자기네들이 범죄를 저지르고 있을 겁니다. 그래서 저는 여러 가지 여기서 쓰는 용어들은 제가 이해를 못하지만 은 굉장히 아, 나름 중요하다고 생각을 하고 있고 또 지금으로서는 60년 전에 600만의 유대인들이 그랬던 것처럼 지금 현재 북한의 국민들은 죽음을 앞에다 놓고도 그들이 할수 있는 게 없잖아요. 우리 강 기자님도 잠깐 말씀하셨지만 은 하고 싶어도 뒤에서 누가 지켜주지 않으면 은할수 없는 게 우리들이기 때문에 죽음을 앞에다 놓고 그들이 할수 있는 게 없기 때문에 예, 여러분들이 이렇게 나서서 해주시지 않으면 은 우리 북한 사람들한테는 희망이 없다는 거죠. 그래서 오늘 이 자리에 또 제로 발언하게 해주신 데서 굉장히 감사하게 생각을 하고 있고 또 굉장히 뭐 예, 그래서 제가 <웃음> 인사를 이렇게 드리겠고 정말 오늘 그냥 감사하다는 말밖에 할게 없습니다. 감사하다는 말보다 더 좋은 표현이 있었으면 좋겠는데 그게 없는 게 정말 아쉽고 예 감사합니다. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Um, <웃음> We'll take a, 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 just a couple of questions. Uh, we have a couple of microphones in the back. The gentleman in the back, yes. Thanks. I'm um, Jack Rendler with Amnesty International. And I wanted to ask Ms. Gori uh, in particular, um, we've got a succession going on in, in North Korea. Next year is a big year for the North Koreans. Is there... Um, any sort of a, a European Union strategy uh, that takes advantage uh, of those two things in the year ahead. And uh, perhaps it's a good opportunity in this year's uh, articulation of the resolution in the UN to be uh, more forceful in the language, uh, perhaps referring to uh, widespread and systematic violations or uh, words that will get the attention of the North Koreans. Uh, why don't we just take two more questions and then um, Lady here and, and Roberta and then we'll end. Um, Susan Lee from Georgetown University. Um, I wanted to know, um, I guess maybe this is for um, Ben Rogers, but maybe others can talk about this as well. Some of the, um, the mood among the people of North Korea, how they feel about the impending regime change or if they're aware of it at all and how they sort of feel about the current uh, <coughs> regime now. Thank you. Uh, Roberta. Uh, yeah, I wanted to um, follow up what Jack Bendler said, uh, and that was kind of an appeal to the European Union uh, because the previous rapporteur, as was pointed out, uh, came very close. I think he even might have mentioned the Security Council at one point. So we had his years of work reaching a certain conclusion to walk backwards and say, well, we have a new rapporteur and he has to begin to know everything. Uh, before we can reach any uh, request for a commission of inquiry, seems like we're going backwards rather than building on the information we know. Um, and I, I really feel that um, there has to be a revisiting of that. And the other point on that is that the resolutions or the reports of the Secretary General refer to neighboring countries uh, when they're talking about China and refugees. Um, and I know the previous rapporteur did not want to uh, directly deal with China because he felt his mandate had to do just with North Korea. And yet here's a very direct relationship between uh, the refugees that go to China and are repatriated, forced back, and punished. Uh, it's not something you can separate. But I noticed that Ban Ki-moon in his reports does refer uh, to neighboring countries. I think uh, he went a little further in the... I think a recent report. And I just wonder whether the European Union or other states are prepared to make reference or take this issue on, uh, either in a separate resolution or in some kind of um, uh, other strategy that you might have. Because everyone seems to be backing away uh, from having anything to do with China other than referring to the issue uh, every now and then, uh, but nothing really strong. Um, and I think it sounds like it's time uh, to do that. So why don't we um, take these questions and we'll go with uh, Gisela and if you can address those questions and any final remark you may have. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the floor and uh, for the question. Um, 
first, the first question about the strategy. Uh, what can I say at this point is that, as I said in the beginning, uh, human rights are put at the core of external uh, action of the European Union. Uh, with a new, I don't want to be long about all the institutional changes and what has happened with the new uh, legal framework, but the European Union is working on uh, its new approach to human rights, a sort of new strategy, both for the European Union and as well with respect to specific countries. So I can't go beyond this at that moment because uh, it's not yet public, but uh, there is thinking. I mean, there is thinking and reflection going on um, for the specific countries, for uh, having a more thorough strategical approach um, on human rights uh, within the new configuration of the European Union uh, following uh, the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, about the language of the resolution which is currently um, uh, proposed, you know that uh, the resolutions that the UN are a fight on language, if I may express myself in this way, and uh, the EU is again running, I mean I have a sort of project, uh, I can't go into more details, but uh, they, I mean the language is trying to be as forceful as it's possible, but also shall remember always that the European Union is composed by 27 member states and there must be a sort of common position. Uh, of all the member states, but let's see if it can go, I mean, and be more forceful than it was um, in the past. And uh, just a final point um, to the issue of a special rapporteur. Uh, when I, in my intervention before, what I meant was that uh, I did not mean that the special rapporteur shall start from scratch, no. What I meant is that the current position, I mean the current European Union position is uh, just to leave some time to this rapporteur to continue the work which has been done uh, before adding another body because we have also experience in other countries where there are commission of inquiry and then it doesn't help much further. But I mean I'm open to critics on this point. Uh, as I told you this is the current position which may evolve as well for the European Union. What? Ah, sorry. Uh, your work on China. As I said, uh, if I did understood well, uh, you mean the Secretary General reference? A reference to China with regard to what they're doing on our country. Yeah. Um, I don't, um, as I told you, I mean, the European Union is raising this issue with China. Uh, I can't tell you at this point whether this specific point will be in the resolution or not. I was trying quickly to have a look to the test itself. Uh, but, I mean, this is something on which we are sensitive anyhow. <laughs> so, I mean, it can be, uh, I, will, uh, I will make it present. Thank you. Ben, you want to um, address Susan Lee's question? Sure. J just a couple of thoughts. Before I uh, address that question, could I just very briefly say um, I'm really grateful to Roberta Cohen and, and Jack for asking that question and, and just to say that we, uh, we have an office in Brussels and we, we'll be doing everything we can to uh, encourage the EU uh, to, uh, to include the, the kind of things you've, um, you've been suggesting. Um, uh, in relation to uh, the mood among people in North Korea regarding change, I, I have to be uh, absolutely honest, and I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone, uh, by saying that the, the people we were able to talk to were North Korean regime officials and our minders. We weren't able to get out and about and, uh, and do an opinion poll of, uh, of, of popular opinion. Um, uh, the officials that we did talk to, one of them actually used the phrase, this is, uh, we are entering a period of momentous change. Um, uh, and uh, I don't really know what uh, he meant by that, but he, he did use uh, that phrase. It's also interesting to note that the regime, uh, just before our visit, uh, had started to shift its general rhetoric from uh, the military, of, military first uh, uh, language to language around building a, a prosperous nation. Um, and again, uh, uh, it's hard to know how to interpret that, but. Uh, uh, but that was, that was quite interesting. Um, but I, I do have a lot of sympathy for the point made earlier in the day uh, that uh, p some people who visit Pyongyang and come back and say uh, things are changing you know, are really misled. And I hope that Lord Alton, Baroness Cox, and I are, are the exception to that, uh, that general rule because I, you know, I don't see any 
uh, signs of, of significant change. But as far as what the mood of, of people is concerned, I, I'm not really in a position to answer that. Uh, maybe Kang Chol Huan and, uh, uh, and other defectors who are in touch with people uh, in the country um, would have a, 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 a better answer to that. J just before I close, um, just to say, though, that uh, if anyone would like a copy of our report on our visit to North Korea, which does go into a bit more detail on some of these things, um, again, please do give me your email, and uh, I, I, I'll happily email that to you, along with but perhaps some of the other things that I've uh, uh, offered earlier on. Greg, any final remarks? Then followed by Mr. Khan. Yes, the Middle East has been mentioned, and also Mr. Kang Chol Hwan has mentioned uh, the fact that uh, increasing numbers of North Korean workers are being dispatched <coughs> overseas. What we see is a different reaction from what we saw in 1989 when communism fell in Eastern Europe. The North Koreans recalled all students from Eastern Europe, had them brainwashed, had them detained in camps, <coughs> produced a documentary for high-ranking government officials to tell them that it was not only the leaders at the very top, but all apparatchiks and all Communist Party leaders who had suffered and had been imprisoned, which was, of course, not true. Um, they were able to do that, and 22 years later, the Kim regime is still in place. But what we have learned is that 200 North Korean workers are still in Libya, and the Kim regime is not repatriating them. Now, this, I don't know exactly what this means. It may be simply a matter of not having the budget to bring them back, but it might also mean that the regime, despite the fact that egregious human rights violations are still happening, extrajudicial killings, torture, uh, public executions, 200,000 people in prison, in political prisoner camps outside the judicial process with no judicial process at all. Nevertheless, the regime s appears to be less confident than it was 22 years ago, that it can still keep these people under control and keep the ideas that they might bring over to North Korea from spreading. One final remark, we have mentioned the issue of language in a different context. Based on our experience with Banco Delta Asia a few years ago, it seems that the North Korean regime does understand the language of international finance. Um, I think that we need to increase our leverage. We need to enhance our, our leverage by identifying pressure points, in particular by understanding North Korea's hidden financial system. And this is a topic that we definitely plan on addressing at the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Khan, uh, final comments, remarks from you. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> 그래서 그 북한의 국가안전보위부의 그 핵심 간부였던 그 류경이라는 사람을 어 김정일이 이제 도끼로 까주겠다 이제 그런 소식이 이제 들어왔습니다. 아 이거는 이제 뭐냐면 소위 정보기관의 최고의 수장을 김정일이 이제 죽였다는 얘기인데요. 어 그리고 또 하나는 그 노동당 조직부라는 그러니까 국가 권력 당의 핵심이었던 그 이재강이라는 사람이 교통사고로 죽었다. 그러니까 이 김정일 체제를 지키고 있는 오른팔 왼팔이 예, 동시에 이제 죽었다는 거죠. 아, 그리고 이제 어, 그 다음에는 그 박남기라고 하는 노동당 재정기획 부장 부부장이 어, 공개 처형당했습니다. 화폐개혁 책임을 지고 어, 그 이후에 이제 노동당 어, 그 내각의 재정상을 지냈던 문일봉 씨가 어, 처형당했고 어, 그 다음에 어, 철도상 그랬던 이제 김용삼 부상이 이제 또 처형당했고 그리고 최근에 그 홍석형 어, 김일성 가기하고는 이제 약간 친척 관계가 되는 어, 그런 사람인데 불구하고 이제 홍석형이라는 사람이 어, 사실상 이제 그, 그 수용소에 끌려간 것으로 저희가 확인을 하고 있습니다. 아, 이 홍석형은 어, 김일성 홍석형의 어, 이 권모되는 분이 김일성, 김일성의 부인이었습니다. 아, 그리고 이제 이 홍석형의 할아버지는 홍명이라고 하는 아주 유명한 이제 그 작가였는데요. 이 홍석형은 이제 김일성과 이제 그 친구 같은 이제 그런 사람인데 이 홍석형을 이제 김재래가 잡아간 거죠. 그래서 이 이재강과 유경을 죽인 이 포인트는 아마 후계 구도하고 연관이 돼 있다. 
그러니까 이제 후계 구도 과정에서 김정일이 지금 당장 죽었을 때 자기 아들을 희두를 희두를 이제 이 파워들을 이제 먼저 제거한 거죠. 그리고 두 번째로 죽기 시작한 뭐 이런 그 박남기나 어, 김영삼이나 문일봉이나 홍석형은 어, 중국으로부터 오는 개혁개방의 압력을 어, 차단하기 위한 본보기가 아니냐 이제 그런 생각이 듭니다. 그래서 지금 북한이 어, 가장 지금 그 두렵고 경계할 대상이 어, 저는 미국이나 남한이 아니라 저는 중국을 보고 있습니다. 왜냐하면 중국 지도부가 보는 북한은 어, 이제 굉장히 위험하죠. 개혁개방을 하지 않으면 이제 망하게 되어 있습니다. 그렇지만 중국이 언제까지 북한을 살릴 수도 없어요. 그래서 지금 이 시점에서 강제적인 개혁개방을 안 시킬 경우에 이 파괴적인 이제 붕괴가 온다. 그렇기 때문에 중국이 원하는 것은 김씨 왕자가 계속 살아, 살아남는 게 원하는 게 아니라 중국식의 개혁개방을 해서 중국과 협력할 수 있는 체제가 남, 살아남는 거 이걸 원하고 있는 것이죠. 그래서 중국은 어떻게 하나 북한 내부의 개혁개방 세력을 어, 키워서 어, 이들로 하여금 중국과의 관계를 계속 끌고 가, 가도록 하는 그 전략을 추가하고 있는데 김정일은 중국하고 붙는 놈들은 다 죽인다는 이겁니다. 지금. 그래서 그 이. 박남기나 홍석형이나 이 문일봉이나 김영삼은 대부분 이제 어, 경제 부분 관료들로 중국식의 개혁 개방을 주창할 수밖에 없는 이제 그런 인물들로 이제 어, 연계가 되지요. 이건 뭐냐면 김정일이가 후계 구도를 하면서 어, 죽어도 개혁 개방 안 하겠다. 저는 이걸로 보고 있습니다. 그래서 이 파괴적인 붕괴는 불가피하고 어, 저는 중국도 어느 시점에는 이제 손을 놓을 수밖에 없다. 그 타이밍은. 어, 국제사회가 어떻게 중국을 설득하는가에 따라서 달라질 수 있다. 저는 그렇게 보고 있습니다. 그래서 저는 어, 이 중국과의 관계, 이 중국이 북한을 놓을 수 있도록 어, 그 먼저 수행돼야 될게 탈북자의 강제 복성. 이거는 중국 정부가 사실은 어, 도덕적으로 아주 이제 그 못할 짓이기 때문에 어, 이 중국 정부의 탈북자 문제를 가지고 압박을 가하면 중국은 견딜 수가 없습니다. 그리고 어, 이 국제법을 위반하는 이제 그런 측면도 있다고 좀 보고 있거든요. 어, 그렇기 때문에. 아, 이 중국으로부터의 북한의 어떤 그이 분리, 어, 저는 이게 아주 중요하다고 좀 보고 있습니다. Well, thank you very much. Uh, anything I can say or add would be superfluous, so I'm going to end it here. And 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 please uh, uh, help me thank the panelists. I think it was a terrific panel discussion. <웃음> At this time, uh, I would like to introduce our uh, our. Final um, speaker who's going to provide closing remarks. Mr. Kim Sang Hun is the chairman, board of directors of the Database Center for North Korea Human Rights and international human rights volunteer, a member of Amnesty International. Uh, he has uh, won various accolades, including uh, Asian Hero by the Times Magazine in uh, November 2004. Please uh, welcome Chairman Kim Sang Hun. Thank you, Professor Gu. <coughs> I'd like to thank you all for being with us uh, today uh, at this seminar. That addressed the most horrifying crimes against humanity in the world. We discussed new information. A number of recommendations were made and new suggestions were made at this seminar today. Nevertheless, in my view, there is an important question we should all consider. What have we accomplished to stop the crimes against humanity being perpetrated in North Korea? We all agree that human rights viol violations are serious crimes, but we should not overlook the fact that such crimes are at the same time a source of shame everywhere in the world, such as murder, rape, robbery, and etc. While Advocates of human rights, for example, are proud and looked upon with respect. When they are arrested, tortured, or even executed, 
North Korea's leaders are exactly aware that they are guilty of crimes to be ashamed of. This helps to explain why they are attempting to keep the presence of political prisoners camps in North Korea a secret. They may deny the information we discussed this afternoon, or they may deny entire discussion we have here. Nevertheless, in reality, they are deeply shaken and so seriously nervous when references are made to their shameful crimes. Even by a little whisper, they are shaken. I honestly believe that our work, which we are doing outside North Korea, is effective, as some of the speakers indicated this afternoon. I want to assure you all that we have made a difference today, much more than we think we did. In my views, we are all champions of human rights, and our efforts carry greater weight than we realize. Today, we have made a significant contribution and our hope is that somehow North Korea's political prisoners will know that they are not forgotten and that advocates like you work hard for their freedom and consequently North Korea will change definitely. North Korea will change soon. Let them know that we are concerned and we are watching. We should not tire of doing what is right. Let us not give up our hope to stop crimes against humanity. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This now adjourns the conference. If I can kindly ask you to put your, um, this transmitter radio uh, on the table and uh, some, uh, our staff will pick it up. Thank you very much.